don't know if you've, but there's been several studies in the last couple of years about the emperor penguin going extinct. And I was often curious about it because how do you get, why would the male accept an egg and balance it on his feet for two months while the wife goes off in place during the coldest, most brutal winters they've ever seen? And, and I was curious what would make a guy do that. If, how many people saw the uh, uh, March of the Penguins? Okay, that doc, it was a beautiful documentary. Well, this population actually dropped. And the, 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 that population is what's given rise to all these uh, horror stories about them going extinct by the end of the century. So emperor penguins, because they're so big, it takes nine months for their chicks to fully develop. So they have to breed through the winter. That's probably why the male, because the female ex, uh, uses up a lot of energy on the egg, is likely for her to go first. Plus the male's bigger, and he has a little bit more thermal inertia. So that's why the guy was stuck with it. I still think it's unfair, and I hope that behavior doesn't spread, but that's another story. They, because they're so big, they can't get up any kind of steep slope. They have to, they can only jump up a little bit. They're very clumsy. So they nest on fast ice. Fast ice is ice that's fastened to the, to the coastline. And that becomes real thick, and that's where they breed. So the, the story was, well, CO2, as CO2 increases, it warms things, it melts the ice, and when the ice melts, the baby chicks fall into the water and drown. And they made allusions to this. Well, <laughs> I asked the guy. I couldn't find any evidence of that. I looked at satellite pictures when they were saying this. And the guy who printed that he thought the babies were falling in because the ice was breaking out early, I said, can you give me some dates so I can correlate it with satellite stuff? And he goes, well, it's really hard to find these right now. So why do you publish this? We have no information, but you're pushing this as a, as a climate horror story. And this is a graph showing how the population shown in the March of the Penguins declined between the late 60s and the 80s. It wasn't obvious in the documentary, but a French research station was right next to the ice where the penguins bred, which is why it is the best studied population. And what they did to study it is they put flipper bands on it. And so it, right when the population started to decline is when they started flipper banding. And when you put the flipper bands on, when, when the birds start to molt their, their wings, their flippers engorge with blood, and it actually atrophies. The, the flipper acts like a tourniquet. So they found a number of deaths due to that. They found some places that the flipper makes it harder for them to swim, harder to hunt. But that's not, there's other things that goes with this, but if, if you look when it, the decline sort of ended, it's when they ended the flipper banding. There's a little bit of a drop after that, but it sort of coincides with the French wanted to build an airway, a runway. So they were dynamiting islands and bringing them together, and that was destroying thousands of uh, Adelie penguin colonies and disrupting the emperors. So there was a lot of other issues. David Ainley is a penguin expert. He's in Antarctica. We had a, a number of exchanges, and he actually apologized for this graph. But he had this graph to sh for, for educational purposes. He wanted students, teachers, to use this graph and show them how, as temperature rises, penguins died. And he even gives a helpful hint. He said, you know, ask your students what happens if the temperature keeps rising. And his little hint section said, you know, if they don't answer, tell them, you know, penguins will be extinct if it keeps rising. Well, there's... There's some problems with this. The, the, I mean, let me just say one more thing about this flipper banding. If they didn't die from flipper banding, they were disturbed. And what they would rather do when you have 20, 30 degrees below zero, they huddle together. You can make a microclimate where you sort of conserve your energy, like a big body mass would do. Well, the flipper band them, you, you wrestle with this penguin. And I, I banded birds. But you wrestle with this 70-pound penguin. He's given up all the energy he's trying to save to, to do his fast for four months before the, the lady hopefully shows up. The other thing with this is they'll drive to, to read the band. They break them out in single, double, triple file so they can read the bands easier when they'd rather be doing this. So what it, we now know from remote sensing is a lot of these birds, they didn't die. They just got up and they left. They said, I'm tired of this. This is crazy. And they've been able to see penguin poo on the, on the snow where their new colony has started. Well, but the worst of it was if you looked at the data from the French uh, weather station. There was no global warming. There was absolutely no trend. The only, the, what they, they highlighted was this spike. And this is a weather spike. It's not a climate spike. But if you look at the trend, there's been no change. But they blamed it on global warming. And, and, and I asked David, I, I emailed, I said, how do you justify this? Here's, the, here's his arrow showing them going extinct. Here's the real data. And I like this guy. I think he's a great biologist. But again, I said, won't you get a belief it possesses the mind? And he said, I'm sorry, that's what I thought was happening. You know, and Mark Twain had a thing. A lot of people just accept things 
on second hand without checking it out itself from people who hadn't checked it out themselves either. And what good scientists really got, we got to dig deep, but most people don't have time to do this. So these extinction stories just fly with people, and they shouldn't. That's why I wrote the so why, if, if I got no warming in Antarctica, I had no warming in California, I mean, what's causing the steep rise? Well, there's, there's two issues, and one is data homogenization. And when climate scientists adjust the data, they, they do something that no other science does. If, if you adjusted the data to make a publication, you'd be, have your retraction or you'd suffer some kind of disciplinary action. In climate science, it's, it's the common thing to do. You adjust the data until to, it seems what should be right, and there's good reason. If a weather station changes, you've got to adjust it. If the instrument changes, you've got to adjust it. But then what's left over, if you look at, here's the original data from California, uh, Cuyamaca, you see this peak. Does it remind you of a cycle? The Pacific Decadal Oscillation. Well, they didn't know that Pacific Decadal Oscillation was only named in 1996. Well, they looked at it and said, that doesn't make any sense. So they homogenized the data, and now they got this nice trend. So, ah, that's just the way it should be. And there's a number of scientists that published and said, this is crazy, and they've analyzed it. And if you look at the global trend, if you took the raw data that wasn't homogenized, the trend would only have been 0.4, well within what we could think of happening in, in, in natural cycles. Once it's homogenized, it went to 0.7 over the century. The other reason we're seeing people say, oh, it's, it's still some of the hottest weather ever, is when you average it all together, you don't realize where it's happening. It's not happening globally, it's happening locally. And you have two hot spots. One hot spot here in the Antarctic Peninsula, and a hot spot up here in, Ar in Arctic. And what we know, this is not because heat is being accumulated. This is because heat is ventilating from the ocean when the winds move the ice out of the way. Why that one little hot spot in, in Antarctica, while well, the rest of it is sort of cooling, is you have this thing called the uh, Antarctic circumpolar current. The Antarctic circumpolar current is driven by relatively warm subtropical winds that drive relatively warm subtropical waters clockwise around the Antarctic. But it also prevents those warm waters from intruding poleward any further. The one place the current and the winds come close to the continent is at the tip of the peninsula. But in the Arctic you don't have that. The current is blocked by different kinds of continents. So there with these natural oscillations, you have this Atlantic oscillation, that pushes heat up into the Arctic. There's probably more heat below the Arctic. In, in the polar regions, the coldest water is at the top, and salty, warm water is below, and there's probably more heat there that could melt the ice there three times over, if it gets up well. Well, you see, inside is where all, all getting melted because ocean currents are pushing it up. These ocean currents come along Greenland, and they've been melting some of the glaciers from the bottom, not from the top. We see these cycles, and fishery biologists have noticed, if you look at the Greenland instrumental temperatures, it's almost like what I was seeing in, in California. You, you have this peak in the 30s, and then it dropped again, and then it's almost as high now, but not quite as high. We noticed during this 30s, fishery biologists saw a pulse of warm water push up into the Arctic. Cod fisheries opened in Greenland in the 30s, and they stayed until about the 60s, until the, until the warm water retreated. And it matches the way the instrumental temperatures went. It also matches when you had this, this uh, an acceleration of glaciers that uh, started to retreat, then they stop, and then when the waters come back almost exactly now the way it's in the 30s, then it starts to re retreat again. Here's Danish sea ice record, 1937 in, in September. Here it was 2013 in August. I think it was 2000, close to that. But you see almost a similar pattern, and most all of this melting is happening here. And when the winds blow, you, you're having 10, if you compare ice to no ice, you're having a 10 degrees temperature difference. And when the winds blow across this, this is why part of northern Eurasia is warmer than usual. It's this warm air from ventilating heat. A study that just came out a month ago from our top oceanographers was looking out heat has changed over the last three decades. In the last decade, everything in blue is showing where the oceans are cooled. And that's why I said this, uh, you asked about it, here in blue, we see this whole area, the upper 700 meters is colder. What's amazing, if you look at the Arctic, that's cool too. Now, what, what the CO2 people are arguing, they say is, they're saying the reason it's hot there is because CO2 is trapping it, we're accumulating heat. As it causes the ice to melt, then it opens up the water to absorb more heat and less albedo. And so it's accumulating heat. But if you look at this, there's no accumulation. It's the ventilation of heat. 
if you look at the way they try to model the 30s, they run a model and say, here's all our understanding of how natural cycles work and natural weather works. Here's the blue line. And uh, we often hear the argument, well, we can't replicate temperatures unless we add CO2. Well, the truth is, they can't replicate temperatures anyway. The, the models just aren't working. And when they added CO2, it actually made this warm event in the 30s into a cool event. It's because they don't incorporate these natural cycles. What they have you focus on, it, they missed this in the 30s, and what they have you focus on in here. They say, look, when we add CO2, it matches temperatures here, and it won't match it when it's natural. But for me, it's, if you get this right, then I'll trust this. But if you don't get this right, then that, that's just a bogus story. Well, when the models fail, make a good horror story. Um, the polar bear, supposedly going extinct. If you talk to the Inuit, the native, they say it's the time of the most polar bear. And there's good reason why they say that. If you look at almost all these surveys, and I could go, I don't have time, because I'm just going to finish this up in, in one more uh, segment. But if you just look at the biology, you see why it's the time of the most polar bear. When these warm waters from the Atlantic or the Pacific intrude into the Arctic, they bring nutrients. Because it's ice covered most of the time, it's very nutrient poor. When you move the ice, you allow more, more photosynthesis. When you allow more photosynthesis, you get a tremendous bloom that reverberates through the whole food web. Fishery biologists notice that when there's less ice, the cod do better. Not only is there more food, but when the water warms a little bit, it allows them to grow quicker, and during the winter, they survive better. And when you got more, less ice, you got more, more food, you get more seals, you get more bears. And there's several studies that show that. The other reason is that the ring seal is sort of the, the main prey for the polar bear. They stay there all winter. They're tiny, and you don't think they could survive in that kind of cold. But the way they survive is staying in the warm ocean. They spend most of the time in the water, but in the winter, they have to have breathing holes. You can't poke your head through thick ice. That eliminates the population pretty quick. So they need thin ice. And so when the ice first starts to form, they bust through with their heads. And then as it starts to freeze, they chew and they claw to keep that open all winter. And they have several ones that they move. But still, they spend most of their time in the water. The only time they come out and spend enough time on the ice for the polar bears is like March through May, or maybe early June, when they're giving their birth to their pups. And that's when the polar bears time the, their cubs to come out. And they just run through these wood nurseries and eat baby pups. Probably 80, 85% of all the uh, energy goes during these three months. They gain almost all their weight eating, eating the baby seals. If you, if you do all these studies, you look where there's real thick ice. There's very few seals, there's very few bears. But people say, oh, we're losing this, uh, this thick ice. It's killing the seals. It's killing the platform. It's not true. And, and in Wrangell, in 2007, when we had one of the second lowest, people were studying bears on Wrangell Island. And even though it was one of the least amount of ice, the bears were the fattest there they'd ever seen. So you, you start looking at all this data and say, we're just caught in this politics where people are trying to tell horror stories to make you think it's more sensitive, to kind of battle people to think it's not less sensitive. And, and why I'm, I'm optimistic is people like you would say we need more debate, because we certainly do. I'm going to leave this with one last thought. <laughs> I think that's all I have. When you hear about climate change, I want you to first think locally. And local climate changes much different than the average climate. The, the average doesn't tell you what's going on locally. I want you to account for natural cycles, because all these natural cycles will do exactly the same thing that they're saying that rising CO2 does. I want you to account for landscape change. And again, I want you to ask for more debate. Thank you very much. <laughs>
And I don't think anyone wants to go back there. Trees weren't even growing during that time. The, and so if, if it continues to warm despite those kind of changes, then CO2 has higher sensitivity than I give it credit for. But from everything I see, the most important thing to look at is landscapes and natural cycles. And that will explain the majority. Is, it has the most power to change our local climates. And it also, it's the place where we have the most local power to make it better. We can fix our landscapes. We can make them more resilient. Well, you know, I think what you're doing, in one sense, is fostering debate, is really what has to happen. And I wish President Obama would do that. I mean, you know, if you try to debate on the internet, you just call all sorts of names, and it really goes nowhere. But if you could have a well-moderated debate with focuses on a subject and people don't jump around like they do in presidential debates, I think we could educate people more. And so for you sponsoring these kind of talks, I think does wonders in that. In, in terms of what kind of energy product, the electrical engineers are doing a lot to make our, our life a little bit easier, more fuel efficient, whatever, you know, from that point. And I think I've seen different papers on remote sensing. A lot of electrical engineers or, or IEE people are involved in that kind of thing. Uh, the more you look at that, almost all the remote sensing data disagrees with, with the rest of us. They're the ones that say we haven't had any change for the last 20 years. So, I, you know, I don't know if you promote that within your community, get more talks about that kind of stuff with the people. I think uh, remote sensing services is here in California. You might ask them to give a talk on what they're seeing in climate change. Um, I don't know exactly beyond that, depending on what your individual skills are. But uh, if I was to change my career over again, I would have tried to fix uh, the hydrology. I would have tried to fix the landscape instead of just being an environmental educator. I, th I think when you do that, you make the land more resilient, and you, and you make it deal with whatever kind of natural tragedies are going to happen. So. Uh, so maybe if you could, you know, people are looking at, at hydrological engineering, uh, how, we, how we keep the water on the land, instead of just shunting it into sewers, instead of drying out the landscapes, I, I think that would be something. But I don't know if that's sort of within your expertise. Uh, I, and I totally agree with you. And, and, and sometimes I read this stuff and I say, geez, am I right? <laughs> you know, you, and I have to double check and, and look at it at the time. But what I say, there, you see that, that kind of gatekeeper mentality. But I say, you, you tell, if you're a skeptic, you're the greatest threat to the planet. Now, how much do you want to go out and put yourself out there? And the people that do, they get hammered. They, you know, all sorts of evil is spoken against them. And when I go on the internet and I say, gee, I think it's landscape and cycles, they say, you're a denier, you're a, a, you know, a tool of the Koch brothers and big oil, and, you know, you're stupid, you're ignorant. It, and I'm, I'm saying, who are these people? But they'd go for your throat. And I, and I think it's almost, once you think that CO2 is causing everything evil, it, it's like a paranoid if you try to say, oh, don't be so afraid. They go on a high alert and say, you're trying to make me vulnerable. And they come at you. And I, and I sort of feel like some of the people, that they're so bought into that, way, they, they don't step back and look at it. And it's just a debate. And, and if we kind of did these landscape changes and made it more resilient, the debate could go on while we'd satisfy it where it gets warmer or it gets cooler. You know, a better hydrology, better habitat is, is, is really the way you kind of guard, you hedge your bets either way. Again, I, I don't know how to go into the politics of all that, it, but what I say is we, we've seen these subsidies. I think the, the, there's need for government in a certain way, but when you said sort of throw off the market system like they've done with biofuels, you do with this, people are going to find a way to work it. They're going to find a way to scam it. You're going to have, you know, you, no matter who you vote for, you worry about people trying to bribe them once they're in office. And, and I think you have both sides of, of, of Congress. There are people that you don't trust. There's people you do trust. I, you know, I, I don't know how to deal with that. I, so I, I'm kind of as a biologist saying, this is what I see, this is what I'm hoping for, look at it this way. And, uh, and uh, I don't vote for hardly anybody these days, but that's me.